Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Tips for Terrific Tomatoes with the UCCE Stanislaus County Master Gardeners. I'm Ann Shellman, the coordinator for the program, and I am really excited tonight to bring you this class. We have two very talented master gardeners and a local librarian who are going to share with you all sorts of tangy, juicy bits of information about tomatoes. And by the time we're done, you will probably be wanting to eat a tomato. So without further ado, um, we are going to hand this over to Heidi and Terry. Hello, good evening. I'm glad that you're here. Um, I'm Heidi and I have uh, been a master gardener since the beginning of 2019. And um, I didn't, I didn't write in the chat, but my favorite uh, tomato is called the mushroom basket, which is a scalloped red tomato. Very pretty when it's sliced on a plate. And our agenda, oh, Terry, and then Terry is going to be sharing also. I'm Terry Harper and I'm, I've been a master gardener for a year now. And my favorite tomato is the kind you eat. <laughs> <laughs> Give me one, give me one. Okay, go ahead, Heidi. Okay. So our agenda tonight is um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the history of uh, the tomato and its growth habit, um, the difference between a hybrid and an heirloom and uh, the growing season. And then some, some things for trying to grow successful tomatoes because there are some issues that may come up with them. Um, but hopefully with watering, staking, and fertilizing, you can have success. So our, our presentation today is going to focus on uh, tomatoes from transplants, because at this point right now, it's too late to be starting tomatoes from seeds. Although maybe there might be some uh, little seedlings that are coming up from your compost pile which you can let grow, but then a lot of times you don't know what kind of tomato it will be, but it might be a surprise. And then in August, we're going to be teaching a tomato class on learning how to save and start your own tomatoes, save your seeds and start your own tomatoes. So look forward to that. A little history here. Uh, the tomato is considered the number one vegetable grown. Um, and most people who grow tomatoes just love them, obviously. There are more than 15,000 tomato varieties with 3,000 of them as heirlooms and they're actively cultivated worldwide. And then we wanna know, is the tomato a fruit or a vegetable? So botanically speaking, it is a fruit because it is produced from one single flower. It has one ovary and it's self-pollinating. Um, but in uh, 18, oh gosh, I didn't write that down. Uh, in the 1800s, I'll say, uh, the Supreme Court decided that the tomato was a uh, vegetable so that it wouldn't be taxed because it's not eaten for dessert. Okay, Terry. Okay, tomato plants are very productive. One plant can yield 10 to 15 pounds of tomatoes. So when you choose your tomatoes, you're gonna choose, don't choose five or six different, or, you know, plant five or six different tomatoes. You wanna plant enough where you don't have too much tomatoes because they're very productive. Okay, so what, what, I've got to get the next page here. The tomatoes are a member of the Solans, Solan, I can't hardly Acia. Solanacea. I'm not, I'm not scientific. I just grow them. <laughs> I'm not the scientific guy. But they're a member of the nightshade family. So the members of the nightshade family are tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, tobacco, petunias, and potatoes. So um, that doesn't mean that it's poison. It just means that it's got some of the uh, poison in it. It's, it's, it's got very, it's a trace amount of it. And to prove that, uh, I've got one here. It says Colonel Robert Gibson Johnson of Salem, New Jersey, 
had brought tomatoes home from the uh, abroad in 1808. And he had been offering a prize yearly for the uh, largest tomato grown. But the general public considered the tomato an ornament plant rather than for food. So as the story goes, the Colonel, who uh, on September the 26th, 1820, once and for all proved tomatoes non-poisonous and safe for consumption. He stood on the steps of the Salem Courthouse and bravely consumed an entire basket of tomatoes without uh, kneeling over or suffocating any or any ill effects. So there's a lot of uh, fruits that have uh, trace elements of other chemicals in them that they're still safe to eat. So it's even though it's a nightshade family, it's safe to eat. Okay. What do we got here? Okay, tomatoes in the United States. Tomatoes are a native to South America. In the 1800s, they were brought to the United States. It says nightshades, not edible. But then we've already proven that this guy, Robert Gibson, had, had eat them and, and proved that they were safe to eat. Now, here's what gets me is the tomato growth. The growth, you got, you got two different kinds of tomatoes. You got determinate tomatoes and indeterminate tomatoes. The uh, determinate tomatoes grow and sets, they grow in their a certain size and they grow and they set their fruit. Okay, determinate, or bush type, offered the tomatoes as a bush tomato. They grow and set at a set height, they don't grow real tall. And they set their fruit within four to six weeks. And that's great for canning or freezing because the determinate tomatoes grow over a long period of time and you get fruit continuously. But if you want to can it, like the canneries, they, they grow the uh, determinate tomatoes because they get all their fruit within four to six weeks. So that makes them great for canning and freezing. And you can grow those, they're, they're little tomatoes, uh, the plants are small and you can grow them in a five gallon container. And they do better when they're steak because you don't want your tomatoes to fall over on the ground. Now, that's a big problem when they fall over on the ground. They're susceptible to diseases and insect damage when they fall on the ground. So you want to keep them steak. Now, uh, determinate examples. Okay, these are the ones that just grows and sets their fruit all at once. It's a, the bush early girl, the Roma, the celebrity, the patio, the ace and the little Sisley. So you can grow those in your five gallon buckets and you can pretty much stake them. You don't need a very big stake to stake them to keep them from falling over. So that's that's indeterminate's next. And uh, they grow and flower and set fruit during the warm weather. Most tomatoes are sold. Most tomatoes sold are indeterminate varieties and they need some sturdy support too large for most containers. They need support. Uh, you need to stake them real, real good because they, they'll get, my tomatoes are indeterminate and they grow eight feet tall. So you're gonna need a good heavy stake to stake them because there's gonna be a lot of tomatoes in there. The vines will be quite heavy. So you wanna stake them. You can, uh, types of stakes that we can grow them on. You can get the next one there. May I share? Huh? May I share something? Yes. So in the background of my photo, I have I have my tomatoes growing on a trellis. Those indeterminates. That's the indeterminate. Okay. Indeterminate is the easy, early girl, the better boy, big beef, sun gold, and super sweet 100. I'm going to have to try that sun gold. But uh, you need, like I say, you need to stake them. You're going to have to put them on a a heavy stake or a cage to, to keep them from falling over. And as they grow, you won't have to bend over to pick them either. Okay, the determinate versus the indeterminate. Which type should you choose? Okay, growing them in the ground is you can grow any variety in the ground. In small spaces, you want to use determinate tomatoes. And that if you're going to grow determinate tomato, tomatoes, you're going to have to grow them in a 
a five gallon container. It's great for people that senior citizens that live in these complexes. You can grow them in your patios or on your back porch. So it's good to grow them there. And you can, you, you, there's a picture there that shows how to stake them right there with one by twos. Okay. That's ready for a poll already here. Tomatoes are native too. So write your answers down. Alaska, South America, Asia, Australia, Central America. Which one is it? All right, we're going to give folks another 20 seconds to cast their vote. This is more of a pop quiz. Well, it's not really a pop quiz because we didn't tell you the answer. So you just have to guess. The other questions in our poll, um, will uh, you will uh, have studied ahead of time. So the answer to this poll, folks were correct. It is South America, dun, da, da, da. Great job, everybody. A lot of times people will think they were from Mexico because um, you know, they might have heard that they were from the Southern Hemisphere in America, but it's more like Peru and the Andes, and then they made their way up to Mexico and um, up to us. So very cool. Great job, everybody. Okay, we're going to go ahead and take one more poll. Go ahead, Terry. Yeah, if, if you're going, if you're growing tomatoes in a pot, best type to grow is: Are you going to grow determinate tomatoes or are you indeterminate tomatoes in a five-gallon pot? So here's our pop quiz. All right, just about everybody voted so quickly. They must have done us before. <laughs> they knew it was determinant. So now they're going to know when they go to a nursery or garden center. Now, remember, you won't see the name of the term tomato as determinant, but it should say it somewhere on the tag. Great job. OK, we've got one more question here. Ooh, come on, poll. Stop, share. Ready? Go ahead and read the question there, Terry. Okay, when, when growing indeterminate tomatoes in a pot, the best pot size is one that holds five gallons or more of potting mix. It doesn't matter, or five gallons or less of potting mix. So which, which buckets are you going to use here? That should really say determinate. <laughs> no, it's Terry. I'm sorry. Heidi's right. I've seen two typos before tonight. Our apologies. Oh, I yeah. Can't, yeah. <laughs> I can't <laughs> fix it right now. <laughs> oh, no. I can't oh, read it. I don't want to confuse you guys. Indeterminate. All right, we're going to move on. Don't, don't study this slide too much. All right, we've got time to open it up for questions. Any questions? And you can type in uh, questions as we go along. And then when we get to the end of each section, we will ask, we will answer those questions. So. I noticed that this class, you know, it didn't have as many signups as we did for the vegetable class. So I think a lot of people are already tomato experts, but I'm hoping, and we can ask people at the very end if they learn something new. So I guess we can go ahead and move on then. Oh wait, something appeared in the Q&A. Oh, oh, it's a great question. Go ahead, Heidi. You mentioned earlier heirloom tomatoes. What are they? We're gonna talk about that right now. Great question. Okay, so hybrids versus heirlooms. Some prefer one type over the other as you're growing them. Um, you may want to grow both and it usually depends on what your preference is. And so we're gonna find out what the difference is. So a hybrid is actually uh, two tomatoes 
that they crossbreed and for specific characteristics, sometimes for size, like the steakhouse is huge and it was bred for a, that specific size. Sometimes they want to uh, breed them for a specific amount of yield. And then a lot of times they are bred for uh, disease resistance. And um, if you look on the tag of some of the uh, hybrids that you would get at the store, transplants, um, it will have these initials. And we're going to talk about it in the next slide about what those initials stand for. There's different kinds of diseases that can either come from a virus, from a, from a um, fungus, or even from things that would be in the ground that would go up and uh, affect the tomato. And if you look on this label here, the V and the F means that this uh, hybrid tomato has been bred to sustain bacillium, bacillium wilt and fusarium wilt. And then there's the different kinds of races. I was looking that up um, where the F and the double F and the triple F, there's different strains of the fusarium wilt. So if you um, have had issues with different kinds of problems with tomatoes, uh, you might wanna go for a hybrid that has been bred to uh, resist. It doesn't prevent these problems, but it helps to resist them as they're growing. Okay. And then hy uh, common hybrid tomatoes are the early girl ace, better boy, sun gold or sweet cherry, sweet 100 cherry or the Roma. So those have all been bred for those specific either growth characteristics, um, sometimes for them, especially like the, the Roma, because you want they want to uh, harvest them all in one, one time. So th those determinate tomatoes um, would be um, grown for those specific characteristics. And then with an heirloom, the heirloom tomato are, are ones that have been grown over 50 years. The seeds have been saved from year to year. And they, uh, can, the seeds can be saved if you have a specific type of tomato that you really like and you can save those seeds, um, they are less resistant to diseases. So you have to kind of be aware of that, uh, making sure that if you are growing heirlooms, you don't plant them in the same place every year because that will help to um, possibly attract more disease. Um, sometimes people grow heirlooms because they have a very unique flavor or a shape or a specific color. Um, I don't know if, um, you know, when, when we look at tomatoes, there's not just red, there's green tomatoes, yellow, orange, striped, black tomatoes, uh, orange, yellow. So it's really kind of fun to grow different kinds of tomatoes. And a lot of times the heirloom tomatoes, um, if you want to grow a specific one, you might have to grow it from a seed because um, they don't offer all of these varieties at the store as transplants. So some common heirloom tomatoes are the Brandywine, Mortgage Lifter, which is kind of an interesting one. It's called Mortgage Lifter because the person who developed it uh, actually sold the plants and the tomatoes, I think it was in the early 1900s, and he was able to um, reduce his mortgage on his house because of all the tomatoes that he, he sold. The Beefsteak, Mr. Stripey, Rainbow, and the Yellow Pear. And there's the black crim. I saw somebody had that as their favorite. So there's a picture of the black crim. That's a beautiful tomato. Okay, another poll. If you want to save seeds to plant next year, you want to save from hybrid or from an heirloom. Okay, people on this call are are they're honest voters. I mean. Already got okay. Pretty much everybody voted. We're gonna end the polling, Heidi. <laughs> yep, you want to save seeds from the heirloom tomato. The seeds that you save from a hybrid tomato will grow. They just won't grow as the tomato that you took it from. It'll kind of revert back to one of the seeds that it was uh, cross-pollinated with. So 
and it would be a surprise. Any questions? Oh, we have a question. Um, Amber Joy wants to know, does whether a tomato is determined or indetermined affect the actual size of the tomatoes you harvest? Do you tend to get smaller tomatoes from determinate varieties? It, again, it depends on the kind of determinate or indeterminate tomato that is grown. So the size has to do with the tomato itself, not whether it's indeterminate or determinate. Does that make sense? Uh, GMO, so JK wants to know, is a hybrid same as G GMO? No, it is not. And there have been experiments of trying to grow genetically modified um, uh, tomatoes, but it was very unsuccessful. So there are no genetically modified tomatoes at this point. So you're safe. Another question. Minimum hours of sun for tomatoes. Hey, somebody's, somebody's getting ahead of us here. That is going to be our next section, growth requirements. We have a couple more questions. Oh, um, Stephanie wants to know if the seeds of hybrids are a surprise, how are they propagated? Just by cuttings? Uh, well, okay, surprise, let's see. Hybrid, if you, if you save the seeds from hybrids, you don't exactly know what would be grown next year. They're, and they're not propagated, There's, the seeds are saved. Propagating is usually just from a cutting, um, but it's not, it would be something that you would, the seed you would save and plant for next year. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? I know that they have, actually done some grafting of tomatoes to have a root. And I'm not really too um, sure about all that yet. Um, well, but obviously they ago, would be, they would be a, a little more expensive to buy if you had um, a grafted tomato. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, I was at the San Francisco Flower and Garden Show and they had this famous blue tomato and um, it was not very tasty. <laughs> And I'm not really too, Suzanne wants to know about the type of graft and I'm not really sure because I haven't really um, done it. I'm just growing them from seed. That's more fun. Juanita recently opened Aroma and the seeds were sprouting inside. I've seen that. So if, <laughs> if oh good, you planted it, good job. That's cool. um, it usually I, means that yeah. the seed probably wasn't stored correctly. If it had been sprouting, maybe it got wet somehow or, you know, had some kind of moisture in the I think she packet. means like she cut the tomato open and it was sprouting oh. inside the tomato. Oh. I've seen that before. Mm -hmm. Okay. She said yes. Uh, yeah, it's kind of odd. I don't know. I'm sure there's some botanical thing with that. Uh, yeah. And aroma is a hybrid too. So, you know, it could have something to do with, with um, the way the, the cross-pollination that they did to develop the aroma. Nature is interesting. <laughs> okay, we're gonna, Terry's gonna talk about growth requirements, which was one of the questions that Yes, if you're, going, asked. if you're going to grow tomatoes, you've got to prepare your soil and uh, give the tomatoes everything it needs to grow. So and for the soil, you need to mix in several inches of compost before planting and, and use compost as a mulch, not near the base of the plant to help the soil retain moisture. So you want to mix in compost because if you mix in if you mix in too much, it'll pull a lot of nitrogen out of the soil and your tomatoes won't grow as much if you mix too much uh, compost in there. But compost should be broken down. It should be supply all the nutrients that the tomatoes need. So if you're going to use compost as a mulch, you do want to use it as a mulch, but not near the base of the plant. 
because if you mulch it, you don't, when you apply mulch, you don't apply two or three inches. You play, apply four to six inches of it to uh, keep the sun from evaporating the water out of the soil. So the compost is, uh, is it dries out, but the soil underneath where the roots are stays moist. So you want to you want to use your compost, and that helps keeps the weeds down too. Because mm -hmm. if you do get a weed, you, the weed seeds will blow in from wherever the wind carries them. But when you go to pull them, you don't have to dig them or anything like that. You can just pull them out of the compost because they're not anchored into the soil. Okay, and then uh, the, the temperature they, they they love the heat, but they. They won't set fruit if it drops below 55 degrees. And if it's over 100, they won't set fruit either. If it's over 100, they'll be dropping their, their, their seeds, their flowers, they'll be dropping them and they're, they're going into survival mode if it's over 100. So you won't get any fruit if it's over 100. You won't get any to set where you can eat, they'll make tomatoes. Okay. And one thing I, I was just thinking we might want to add is that sometimes you can purchase a blossom set at a nursery or a garden center, and that is only for cool temperatures. So if it gets to be over 100, it's not going to work. Okay. That's it for the heat. The site selection. You got to have it in full sun for at least six hours. That's where I live. I have so much shade, I have a hard time growing tomatoes. So I've got some started, so I hope that I can get some tomatoes off of it. And you got to give the plants enough space to grow. So you got to have a good water supply also. So you want to plant them a few feet apart. It's on the next one here. So you got to have water. Okay, the planting time. You can't plant them in the winter time. They they just <laughs> they got to have 50 to high five degrees to germinate. You got to plant the transplants because now that the soil is warmer, you're going to be trans planting transplants from the nursery. So during the cool temperatures, plant growth is slowed down. So now the night temperatures are in the, in the 40s and stuff. They kind of, they're cold nature. They don't, they don't grow when it's cold. They grow when it's warm. And in Stanislaus County, there's still a 10% chance of frost after March the 23rd. So plant them when the temperatures are, are, are right. Okay, planting tips for a gangly plant. Plant, plant deep roots, plant deep for roots grow better. Let me say that right. Plant deep for more roots better growth. Okay, sometimes if the, they don't get enough sunlight, they get a lot of gangly growth on them. And tomato plants is about the only plant that you can plant deeper than the crown, because most plants you want to plant them at, at ground level. But the tomato plant, you can pick off the foliage on the lower third of the plant before planting, and then plant up to a few inches from the lowest leaves. And tomatoes roots will grow along the stem and you'll have a better root system and produce a better crop. So you, that the, you can plant the tomatoes deeper than, than normal. So that's that's why you do it. Now, I think that's one of Heidi's pictures there, isn't it, Heidi? Yes. Yeah, so uh, it's so, it. She so what I, oh, what? I'm sorry. So what I did is I, I transplanted this into a different pot and you can see down here that there's little uh, roots growing and all these little hairs on the stem will develop into roots. Okay, tomatoes need support. So you're gonna to have to stake or cage your tomatoes when you plant them. You don't want to do it after you plant, you want to do it before you plant them. And uh, some of the methods you can, you can use a cage, a wire cage, like in that first photo, and then you can stake them with one by twos, and then you can use a trellis. So uh, now remember, if you're using determinate tomatoes, you need to use small cages. And if you're using indeterminate ones, you need to use a lot larger cages because I've made my cages 
eight feet tall, I used uh, concrete reinforcing wire. I made my cages eight feet tall and my cherry tomatoes, sweet 100s, grew plumb up to the top of the cage and over the top and came back down on the other side of the cage. So they definitely grow good. And it's, you need to support the cages so they don't fall over. You need to stake the cages at the bottom or, or tie them where they won't fall over. So you can use a uh, conduit or a tree limb or something to tie, tie the stakes together, the cages together where they don't fall over. Okay. Tomatoes need the space. So when you're planting them, you can't grow them you can't grow them real close together. You got a space of rows of stake cages, 30 to 42 inches apart and give them space to grow. And you need to train them to go up the, up the cage. You don't want them to grow through the cage and sprawl out and fall on the ground and grow on the ground. You want them to grow up. You need to keep all your tomato plants up off the ground. And you got to plant them, uh, allow two or three feet between the rows so you can get in there to pick them and stuff. And if the tomatoes can't be staked, plant them at least six feet apart and leave four feet between the rows because they're going to sprawl all over the place. Because I, I grew some in a little tomato cage and it was so thick I couldn't even reach in there to pick them. So you're going to have to thin them out too. And we got that in there on the next page. Cages should be three to six feet tall and 18 to 30 inches wide. So you got to keep them, keep the cages tall enough for the plants to grow because they're, at the end of the season, they're going to be tall. And you got to have them wide enough to uh, support the tomatoes. So you use uh, short cages for determinates and tall cages for indeterminates. And I, I use my tree limbs. I trim my trees. I got a tree I have to trim every year. And I cut those limbs and I as, a, as the tomatoes grow up, I stick sticks through the cages to keep the, keep the limbs inside the cages where they don't grow out of sight of the cage. Okay, the next one. Okay, staking and trellising. Use sturdy wooden stakes six feet long and two inches wide. So you can nail them together and, and drive them into the fount and to the ground for about a foot. And you got to stay about four to six inches away from the plant after transplanting them. And stake tomatoes require pruning to a few main stems. Once a week, prune off suckers to control the size. Okay, now the main stems, you want about three of them to growing up. And you want to keep them, put your sticks in there where they keep them growing straight up. And then on the tomatoes, where the limbs come, uh, where the leaves come out, where the leaf comes out, there'll be another shoot coming out from between that leaf, from the leaf from the stem. The shoot will come out and it'll be a totally new tomato plant. So you want to keep them pruned back. It, uh, after mine get about four or five feet tall, I quit pruning them because I just let them grow. <laughs> So uh, once a week, you got to prune off those, they call them suckers that come out. So you want to keep those pruned off. Okay, staking and trellising continued. Tie heavy twine, twine to the stakes every 10 inches. Now, you got to, when you plant them, as the plants grow, pull the stems towards the stakes and tie it loosely. Trellising incorporates a fence. Okay, so now, like this is Heidi's pictures here. She uses, uh, that's a concrete wire. No, that's cattle panel there. Cattle panel. Yeah, that's cattle, pa cattle panel there. But you want to tie the limbs, the tomato stems loosely, because they will continue to grow in diameter as they grow. And uh, I, I don't use the twine. I use, uh, I use old bed sheets, uh, t-shirts and stuff is cut that's soft. Because when the wind blows and you got the twine tied around there, and it'll cut right into the tomato plant. So I, I use soft material to tie it with so that when the wind blows, it doesn't cut into the tomato plant. So 
So may I may I interject? So this this uh, photo on the right, I've started pushing those tomatoes towards the uh, the cattle panel and then tying them when they started growing very tall. So by the end of the summer, these this is photos from last year. By the end of the summer, they were growing over the top of the cattle panel and over onto the other side. So all those indeterminates. And then we did have a question. Um, oh, how do I make it small? Uh, Laura wants to know their varieties that do better in the high heat. I don't, I don't, I don't know for sure, but I just all tomatoes like the heat. And so um, I, I don't know that it really matters. Do you know, Terry? This one, yeah. What varieties do better in high heat? Uh, no, I don't know. Uh, I have. Good, yeah, the good news is um, it's the varieties that you find at local nurseries and garden centers. Um, they do a really good job. And we do have a publication we'll share with you guys that I mentioned that um, talks about uh, some recommended varieties and ones that you can find locally. So you just have to be aware sometimes if you purchase a plant at a big box store, they may be getting plants in from all over. <laughs> for example, I've seen northern high bush blueberries for sale when we would do better here with southern high bush blueberries. I don't know about the tomatoes. I mean, as far as I've seen, the standards of Ace and Celebrity and Better Boy and Early Girl and the heirlooms like Brandywine and Black Crim and Mr. Stripey, that all the ones we've talked about that you have on your handout, there's a lot to pick from and they all love the heat. So great question. Uh, and yeah. Suzanne wants to know, <laughs> and is where, Oh, she wants to know I where you're I wish, sitting. no, <laughs> Suzanne, I stole this photo off the internet because it's so pretty. And I just redid my backyard and it looks so boring because the plants are tiny babies. So someday it will be my backyard. Uh, well, the picture will be, but for now, no. <laughs> and to me, this looks like a plant uh, growth that happens in a more lush area that's cool. So it probably was from the UK, but no. <laughs> Or even the Bay Area. Could be. Okay. Any more questions? So we're going to talk about watering. You want to water them regularly. And um, a drip system is really good because then you have a consistent water watering system. And um, keeping the root ball moist uh, when, it's, when it's establishing. Now, Terry was talking about pruning earlier, and here's a good picture of the shoot that's coming out here off of the stem, off, off of this large stem right here. So this is a leaf that comes off, and this little area right in here um, is where the sucker would be growing and where you would want to prune it. Yes, right in there. And then there's another one developing right there. So, um, that's a really good picture about how to prune it. Um, and then uh, you want to, uh, once your tomato is um, established, you want to um, just water it really deep. And um, it's really okay to let the tomato plant, once it's established, to be a little bit stressed, water stressed, because that will help it not to get too much green growth and um, set more fruit. That almost, that, that picture right there almost looks like there's too much water with it sitting there like that. I don't think I would water that much, but because it looks like it's just sitting in a puddle and that might be too much. You might get some a root rot on that. They might have more of a clay soil, so it may just That's be true. that it hasn't quite gone in. Gone in yet. But yeah, yeah making sure that um, the soil doesn't stay wet is right. uh, too wet. And that's where the mulch um, and the compost would help when you have that, keeping the, the soil most moist in between waterings. And then do you fertilize a tomato? 
Um, I personally don't fertilize too much, um, maybe just at the very beginning when I'm planting it. Um, and then the compost usually helps with fertilizing also. But if you do choose to fertilize your tomato or any plants, make sure to follow the directions of the, the labeling on the fertilized package that you get. And um, when, you, when you fertilize again, um, fertilize when you see those blossoms occurring and then possibly every two to four weeks. And then also when you're fertilizing, I think it's the next, um, oh, maybe not. But if you're, if you're growing your tomatoes in a container, you would want to fertilize there because the water, as you're watering it, you want it to leach out of the bottom. And so the, uh, the nutrients would need to be replenished because you're watering in containers a little bit more. Oh, uh, here's, here was a little note too. And then, so to kind of go back and so when, when you do um, want to check your, your, your water level, when you're in a container is you, you know, you can just stick your finger down in there three or four inches and see if there's a moisture in the soil. Um, and then um, again, watch it during the heat of the summer, because if, um, if, if it is going out the bottom of the, of the container, you would wanna make sure that um, it's not being stressed too much. And sometimes you might even need to water it twice a day if, if it's very um, hot during those times. Okay, and then crop rotation. I talked about this earlier to help prevent diseases and uh, funguses and things, and, and even uh, insects that might like your particular area at that point um, is to rotate those crops. And um, it's usually between two to four years of rotation. But again, if you have a small garden area, a four-year rotation would be very challenging to do. Um, but when you uh, rotate your crops, then it helps to prevent any kind of um, soil depletion of nutrients and um, any d disease or um, funguses and things like that that might affect your growing success. And we're not going to talk a lot about pests tonight because we've got our next class next month coming up, pest management in vegetable gardens. And recently I was asked a question about nematodes, which is a very tricky topic. And crop rotation may not help with nematodes because you may not be growing enough resistant varieties and root knot nematodes like almost everything. So um, sadly, sometimes the answer to how should I do this or that is, it depends, but um, definitely using those resistant um, hybrid varieties of tomatoes. And I believe there are some of peppers, uh, maybe some other things, Heidi, Terry, what? have you seen other crops? For nematodes? Uh, for everything. The VFFN, maybe. Well, I know I've had nematodes on my bee, uh, beans. Mm. And see, I don't know that there are resistant varieties. Oh, resistant. I'm not yeah. sure. So you have to. But anyways, hopefully nobody on the call has nematodes except for me. But we'll talk about that next month. So um, Suzanne has a couple of questions here. How do you make good tomato juice? Uh, juice your tomatoes that you like to eat, I guess. I'm not really sure. Um, if you know, if you'd want to have it fresh tomato juice, or sometimes people might cook it and then uh, cool it and then drink it. And then how deep I do you I think the water? best tomato juice would be salty and brandy wine is one of my favorites. Uh -huh. So that might make a naturally good tomato juice, but I don't know. And actually that might be a good question for the master food preservers. We don't have any in our county, but you could, um, ask someone in San Joaquin. And then um, she also asks, how deep do you water? When it's in the ground, I probably water mine. I have it on a drip system and I, you can see it in the photo behind me here. I have a two um, rows of drip line going to my tomatoes and I probably water them every week to 10 days. 
and leave it, leave the drip system on for about an hour. So, and I just watch, I just watch and look at my tomato. If it looks like it needs a good drink, you know, and it's okay if it, again, if it gets stressed for lack of water, because then it will help to um, set the fruit. And one thing to remember is that tomato roots can go four feet deep. And if you have a sandy soil, that water is gonna go down quickly and evaporate maybe a little bit more quickly. And if it's clay, it's gonna be slower. So sometimes people will ask specifically, how often should I water? And sadly, the right. answer is it depends. So it's it gonna depends. depend on the temperature, it's gonna depend on your soil type, uh, but the best way to deliver that water is slowly yes. and deeply. So you're ready for the poll? So there's another question. What are good companion plants to grow with tomatoes? I don't really, I don't, well, I, I have a book on companion planting and it talks about basil growing next to it, which makes sense because you eat tomatoes and basil together. And this is and another that, situation where um, there isn't a lot of scientific evidence about companion planting, at least from the university standpoint. So, um, but planting anything with a flower near your tomatoes is tomatoes. <laughs> your tomatoes, tomatoes is great because you're attracting uh, more pollinators. Although I believe tomatoes are sometimes partly wind pollinated. Um, They're mostly yeah. self pollinated too. Yeah, misspeaking. So. And then Jeannie has a question. What causes tomatoes to split at the st stems? Mm. So the stem or a split tomato fruit itself, I'm not really sure when it splits at the stem. Um, maybe Jeannie can clarify that for me. And it's then like Su Suzanne has a question for Terry. Terry. You see that, Terry? You have a, a question, uh, Terry. Huh? Uh, Terry Suzanne wants to know: uh, Do you grow Jerusalem, Jerusalem artichokes by your tomatoes? Jerusalem, Jerusalem artichokes? I don't know. Uh, I just I, I never grew Jerusalem artichokes with my tomatoes. I don't know how it would do. I'm having trouble getting the uh, chat box to come up and work here. It keeps freezing up on me and I can't see the questions. Okay. It might be your connection, Terry. So we'll just read them to you. So we can take the poll. Um, Jeannie still, I'm not really sure about her question about the split. So the poll, um, when should you stake your tomatoes? Right, when you plant them, when you remember or never let them sprawl all over. <laughs> Yes, right when you plant them. Okay, and then another poll. Choose all that are true. Uh, determinant tomatoes. Um, put all their fruit on within four to six week time period. Indeterminate tomatoes produce fruit all season long. Heirlooms are tomatoes handed down from generation to generation. So choose all that are true. Yes, they are all true. So Jeannie um, clarified she, her fruit is split by the stem. Oh, I know, I, okay, I know what you mean. I, um, I know that happens with mine too. Sometimes it's the variety uh, and sometimes it's inconsistent watering. Um, Renata just um, shared too. Inconsistent watering can cause it to split. So um, again, 
knowing when to water. And again, go out and you know peruse your, your garden. Take your cup of coffee or your tea and go out and check things out. Okay. And then we are gonna have a pest management um, class in May. So keep your eye out on this on the Stanislaus blog to uh, Stanislaus Sprout blog when to register for that. Yes, and you can save the date now because it will be May 18th. Oh. So okay. don't plan any major events in your life. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Tuesday night again? Tuesday night. Okay. And then um, to help us uh, to determine how we are doing with um, our webinars, we're going to be sending you a, a follow-up survey in three months to ask you how, uh, if you've made any changes with your, um, the things that you've learned in this class and um, anything that will help us to improve the quality of our program. So be aware of that in three months. And hopefully you'll remember, it's like, wait, did I take that class? Oh yeah, so. Yes, you might think, why am I getting this email? So late, so, yeah. Uh, one more thing that would be really helpful for us, I'm going to launch a poll. It is completely voluntary and anonymous. If you could tell us a little bit about yourself, we would greatly appreciate it for our reporting. Again, um, absolutely no, um, uh, you know, we don't want to force anybody to, to do this, but it would be greatly beneficial for us for reporting. So we'll give people just a couple of moments. And then we are going to be hearing from... I, there's another question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Sorry, wanted to know, should I pinch the first flower off? I've never pinched any flowers. So... You know, I had heard, and it was probably an old wives' tale, to pinch off all the flowers of a plant so that your plant gets strong before, you know, it grows. But um, you really don't need to. Your plant will be tough enough to hang in there. And um... all right. Well, thanks to those of you who shared your information. Like I said, it's completely anonymous. And now we are ready to hear from Diane, our reference librarian. And um, if there are more questions, we will take some time and answer them when she's finished. Great, thank you so much, Anne. And thank you for um, having me be part of the, the presentation. So we are really happy to say that the Stanislaw County Libraries, for the most part, are open to the public. You can go in and look at, at the books on the shelves. Um, I say most of them, Turlock still being uh, renovated, uh, Keys and Denaire are open for curbside pickup only. But still, you might not be ready to go into the library or, or, or uh, you're just at home wanting to find out something right now. Well, the perfect way of doing that is to use one of our ebook apps. Tonight, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Hoopla app and how do you get that? Well, you just go to your Play Store or your App Store, look for Hoopla, sometimes it's listed as Hoopla for Libraries, and you download it onto your smartphone or your app uh, or your tablet uh, or your computer. It will download to a PC. And then you enter in your library card number uh, and your, uh, your PIN, the last four digits of your phone number, on Hoopla, they also ask you, you to set up with an email and a password. But once you've done that, you're ready to go. And so on this screen, I'm showing some of the titles uh, that uh, came up when I looked for books on tomato growing on the Hoopla app. And I wanted to talk to you tonight about a couple that uh, caught my eye. So on the next screen, there are the two that caught my eye. So the first one there, you bet your garden guide to growing great tomatoes in any backyard 
garden or container by Mike McGrath. This is the 2020 uh, edition. So he uh, first came out with this book in 2002, and it's uh, gone through ch some changes over the years, especially with the title. But he has great information in there. Um, and I read a little bit of it and the conversational tone of it, of the book is, is just very engaging. Um, it's fun to read. Uh, he has expert insight, uh, fascinating tomato lore. He gives you everything that you need to know about choosing tomato varieties, germination, planting, staking, caging, food, water, maintenance, pest control and diseases and harvesting. And he has a special interest in natural product pest control. So lots of fun stuff in this book. The other one, Epic Tomatoes, How to Select and Grow the Best Varieties of All Time. That was great too. It started out with some tomato history, uh, which I thought was fascinating. You get to learn about over 200 varieties uh, of tomatoes. You learn for, about their planting them, cultivating, collecting seeds. Um, although he focuses, focuses on uh, 10 varieties, especially. Uh, this is a comprehensive guide uh, to various pests, pests and tomato diseases. And he explains how best to avoid them. What's also notable about this one, it has beautiful photos and very clear and uh, useful charts. So that's just a couple of the titles that you can find on Hoopla. On our next screen, I also wanted to alert you that we have a new way to look at magazines um, electronically. So you can view our e-magazines and we have access to over 3,000 of them uh, and about 250 of those uh, are focus on the home and garden category. So for this one, the app that you're going to look for is the Libby app. This uh, app is also used by other libraries to offer eBooks, but the Stanislaw County offers the Libby app uh, to find just magazines at this point. So again, you just look for Libby, download it, enter in your library card number and your PIN, and uh, you're good to go for those over 3,000 magazine titles. So finally, again, I wanted to highlight our uh, library website, www.stanislaslibrary.org. This is where you're going to go to get the most up-to-date information on library services and programs, uh, including uh, access to our library catalog and the books in our libraries. And you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And thank you once again for including the library tonight. Thank you so much, Diane. You always bring such great information and fascinating topics and titles. We appreciate the research you do to bring all of this great information to us. Now we'll turn it back over to Terry and Heidi to see if there's any more questions. Yeah, I was gonna say about uh, planting plants under the tomatoes or other vegetables. When you plant other plants in under them there, it's going to take a lot of nutrients out of the soil. So you're going to have to fertilize them to, to make sure all the plants that's growing there has enough to uh, grow. Great comment, Terry. Competition. Yep. Competition. Although with those tomato roots being four to five feet deep, tomato might, might be the one getting all the nutrients. One thing I will say is thanks to Jeannie for that question about her tomatoes probably splitting. There's things called cracks and cat facing. And um, next month when we talk about the pests, hopefully you will, well, not hopefully that you'll be seeing them in your garden, but we wanted to wait until May because that's when things start showing up. So we're gonna be talking about the insects, the diseases, but the other things that happen that aren't technically insect or disease are considered abiotic, which means without life. So it's like an environmental thing that happens. Um, although sometimes it's a human thing that happens, you know, the bottle said a quarter cup of fertilizer, but I mean, come on, 
a half cup or two thirds is better, right? Now, why is my plant yellow? So that could be um, an abiotic problem caused by a human. So overwatering can be another one, underwatering. And the interesting thing is that on a lot of plants, overwatering and underwatering look the same. So you just have to know what you've been up to. So keep your eyes peeled for this class because I think it's going to be really helpful. If you see anything strange in your garden, take a picture, send it to us. Um, you can always ask questions. And um, I think it's going to be a really fun class. Yeah, okay. uh, Heidi and I was talking the other day about tomato worms, and mm -hmm. she said she hasn't had tomato worms in four or five years. Yeah. I haven't had any tomato worms either. I was just wondering if anybody else has had any tomato worms. So uh, are they eradicated or? <laughs> <laughs> Well, That's what wishful happened? thinking, Terry. That's wishful thinking. Well, you know, Terry, um, Amber Joy asked a question. Do you know, did you notice there are more aphids this year? She's absolutely right. I remember a couple of years ago, I saw hardly any aphids at all. And I think it just has to do with weather. Um, they have a certain temperature that needs to happen and a certain life cycle. Um, and uh, I have noticed them and they do like tomatoes. Um, so since you're gonna be planting your tomatoes now, um, as soon as you see them, get out your garden hose and put a nozzle on it and just squirt them off and that'll kill a lot of them and you can keep doing that. And then if that doesn't work, um, we will jump into um, the, you know, going to a nursery or garden soil center rather to purchase a um, horticultural uh, soap. Not the same as the one that you could mix up in your kitchen. Um, we don't recommend that. I've done it before and I turned uh, some plants yellow because I uh, overdid it um, because more is better. Uh, so we really do encourage that you choose that sort of thing. And I see we have a question. Um, may, I, may I interject? Please do. Uh, if you are going to squirt your tomato, do it in the morning to, to squirt off the aphid so that um, the plant has time to dry off through, during the day because you don't want to have it have wet leaves at night because that could cause other issues with diseases and such. And then uh, Juanita wants to know, she heard tomatoes use nitrogen at the beginning of growth, then they need potassium. And should I add eggshells? Uh, eggshells would supply calcium and eggshells don't break down quick enough to provide the calcium and the, the nutrients that the tomato would need when it's growing. So eggshells are better just to be put in the compost so that they can break down better. And then I'm not really sure about the nitrogen at the beginning of the growth or potassium. The, the best thing is just to choose an all-purpose tomato fertilizer yeah. for um, if you wanted to add those si sorts of nutrients or you could use um, compost just to, you know, help get your garden started. And then there's other types of fertilizers out there. Juanita's going to use a food processor. She's ready. She's going to chop it all up. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information on, you know, how fast it biodegrades and is it going to be in the soil long enough to give the tomato the nutrients it needs? How many eggshells would you want? Um, so yeah, the best thing is to uh, find something that has a label that you like, a product that you like. And there's lots of products out there that you know, say tomato and vegetable fertilizer or whatever. So they, they, uh, ha they've researched that to know which nutrients those particular vegetables need. And eggshells are fun to add to vermicompost or worm composting bins. We had a class on that recently. So if you didn't watch the video, that is a really neat thing to do to save your kitchen scraps for. And if you add them into your vermicompost pile, the worms seem to like to lay their eggs in there and then you can actually see how many new worms you're getting. Well, I don't see any more questions. So I just want to say a special thank you to 
Terry Harper. This was his very first live online Zoom, and we are so proud of him because he did an amazing job. He seems like he's done this a million times before. Mm -hmm. uh, Heidi has been on here several times and is fantastic. And thank you so much, Heidi. And again, Diane, was is this your last presentation or is there one more? Well, I'd like to join you for one more before I retire. Yay. Okay. So Diane is going to retire, which is sad for us, but happy for her. Um, so those of you who've been attending our classes, Diane has been awesome. And we thank her so much. And there was a comment from someone saying that they loved the library. And thank you so much for the information. So thanks, thanks for that everybody. comment. <laughs> All right. I guess I am going to... Um, Go ahead and stop the video. No, that was not the right button. <laughs> I'll edit it somewhere else. So we're gonna say good night for now. Uh, thanks for your patience with all of our technical issues and we're glad that you were all able to join us and we hope to see you next month for pest management in vegetable gardens. Bye-bye. I really will figure out how to turn off this recording. Ha!